Hello. Welcome Hi. back Hi. to Space Alive. Hey, Nick and Terry, how are you doing? Very well. Not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have you seen our fantastic T-shirts? Well, <laughs> oh, hey. The terrible yeah. twins. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, if, if, if anyone in the audience tuned in a couple of weeks ago, uh, they would know about a little surprise, and that surprise is right in front of you. It's a T-shirt um, dedicated to the Space Roundup, uh, and you can purchase your own, <laughs> spacetour.co forward slash shop. Um, a little bit more about carbonaceous chondrite and why we've named it, um, why we've dedicated to the Space Roundup, Nick. Carbonaceous chondrites. Um, well, obviously, very recent fall we had um, uh, with the Winchcombe meteorite was carbonaceous chondrite, some of the most famous and best studied meteorites in history, including the 1969 fall in Mexico, the Yende uh, carbonaceous chondrites. So extremely rare, very precious. And you guys um, have a nice little selection of meteorites that you sell as well, which is really, really cool. So there we go. We do, yeah. So uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Again, the Space Roundup is where we bring you the latest and greatest of space news with experts and astronomers Nick Howes and Terry Mosley. Um, without further ado, without further ado, uh, let's get into tonight's show. I hope you guys have a good one. Excellent, excellent. Terry's got the best opener today. This is a cracker. Uh, all right. yours, all yours, Terry. Yeah, I've been given the honour of kicking off this time. It's oh, about oh, oh, we've got a different slide right. for it. Oh, there, can, we, right. can we bump forward onto the next slide? Keep going, keep going. I don't think we've got the right order on the on the show, but let's keep going because we'll do this right. properly. Yeah, okay. this is, you'll get back to it shortly. So yes, go, back. Go, on. go forward, go forward. One more. Keep going. And one more. Nope. Yay! Yes. That's one. Yeah, <laughs> This actually ties in quite nicely with one of the aspects of this, and that's uh, the, the way time works. Supernova <laughs> Requiem, 10 billion light years away. This is all mind-boggling stuff. But I want to start off by saying just how good an example this is of how science works. Science works basically by somebody coming up with a theory which makes predictions. And those predictions are then tested and checked. If necessary, they're revised and then it repeats again. And you keep doing that until you find something maybe that is better than your theory or a final modification for the theory. It's a, stat a continually evolving process, not static. And this goes back to our dear old friend Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity. And it's one of the most widely tested uh, theories ever made a number of predictions, all of which have come true. First of all, time dilation, that at very high speeds time alters, that gravity affects time, that gravity bends light. That was first demonstrated during a uh, total solar eclipse in 2019, where they actually measured it um, by showing the amount that light from distant stars was deflected by the gravitational field of the sun. Obviously, you can only do that during a total solar eclipse because you can't see the stars otherwise. So one of the other predictions of um, the gravity of Einstein's theory is that you get an effect called gravitational lensing, where very massive objects, depending on the scale, that can be anything from a star up to a galaxy or a whole cluster of galaxies, the gravitational field of those bodies will actually bend the light of objects behind them and act as a sort of a lens. We've seen that on a number of occasions. So with uh, not only galaxies, but galaxy clusters and so on. The interesting thing about this is, not only have we actually seen the effect, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, there's a nice prediction which will eventually be tested. And if we're still doing this program at that time, we'll no doubt be covering it. So this is Galaxy Supercluster MACS J0138. And Hubble Space Telescope uh, imaged it in 2016, and they noticed that there were three separate images of a distant supernova, which was lying behind that supercluster. Now, a supercluster is obviously a sort of a conglomerate of a whole lot of galaxies, so it doesn't have a perfectly spherical gravitational field. And the effect of that was it broke up the light from the distant supernova lying behind it into three separate images all of which appeared around the perimeter of the photograph of the, the galaxy cluster itself. They could tell it was all from the same ob uh, object because of the spectra, because of the way the light of all three images varied. Then three years later, when they looked at it again, as you would expect, the supernova had faded 
and um, the, the three images were no longer there. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. They did the calculations and they said, right, there's actually going to be another image of that distant supernova, which will appear in the year 2037. What they did was they calculated from the images what way the gravitational field of the uh, clusters and the dark matter within that galaxy superstar would affect the light that would pass directly through the cluster towards us. And they reckoned that it would be delayed by sort of a gravitational pinball effect and the, the effect of the particularly of the dark matter. And that that light, the final image, maybe not the final one actually, but the next one that we can expect to see will arrive in the year 2037, give or take a couple of years. So the light that we have already seen has gone round the outside of the cluster, being bent around it like they, they basically like a telescope lens. And you would think because that's a longer path, that would actually uh, take longer to get here. Uh, but what they've done with these calculations is that the light that is going to pass through the intense gravitational field, particularly from the dark matter in the supercluster, will actually end up delaying the light and it will come on uh, the path through the cluster. So in 2037, plus or minus two years, uh, we'll be looking out to see if an image of that supernova, still the same supernova, it's just that the light is taking longer to get us. And what they're hoping is that if that turns out to be true, it will tell us a lot about the mysteries of dark matter and how it affects, um, uh, well, a whole lot of things, but in this case, particularly the passage of light. Uh, if we haven't already cracked dark matter by 2037, which you would sincerely hope that they will have because it makes up most of the matter in the universe. So what do you think of that one, Nick? It's it's an amazing story. I mean, as you said, you, you look at Eddington in 19, 1919 in Principe when he basically was the first person to really prove Einstein was correct with this whole yeah. idea of the, the curvature and the bending of space time. And it's one of those things that you kind of learn about at undergraduate level and, you know, the whole idea of having a rubber sheet and putting a metal ball in the middle and it get bending space time. And then you watch movies like Interstellar and you can see these incredible visualizations of things like black holes, which again are warping everything around them because the gravitational fields are so intense. But to see this actually happening, and to see these multiple points appearing, and the, you know, as you said, this isn't the first time this has happened, where you've got a gravitational lens where something in the background basically has been split into multiple objects uh, around the gravitational lens, and they're appearing at different times. I find that just astonishing. And the fact that, as you said, the light travel times, you've got differentials in the light travel times because these objects are so distant. And if you think about this, this is 10 billion years ago. So if we take the Big Bang theory, you know, 13.7 billion you know, years in, in the distant past, as it were, when it happened, you're looking at entire galaxies forming and then stars dying and creating these, you know, A, these lenses in the intermediate space. Something's created this lensing effect in the intermediate space. And then the supernovas occurred. And then on top of that, you've got the differential in the light travel time. But then, mm -hmm. as anyone who studies this knows, one of the first detections you typically get when a supernova kicks off is neutrino detections. So some of these underground tanks, which are just filled with you know, pure water, distilled water, and very, very sensitive uh, photosensors all around the inside of caves, uh, typically, picking up neutrino bursts. And now, with the capability we've got, you can almost directionally locate where those neutrino bursts have come from in the sky. Now, by 2037, hopefully we'll have not only the James Webb Space Telescope up there doing incredible observations of objects like this, but also the Square Kilometre Array on, online. Now, the Square Kilometre Array is this vast radio telescope which you know can survey the entire sky, the Southern Hemisphere, in a matter of hours. It's just an astonishing feat of, of technology and engineering that's just starting to kind of progress now. It's been years and years in discussion and testing and, and various other things but between the two of those being able to see and detect so much more and then other telescopes that you know various space agencies are planning on putting up and you only have to look at spacex's capability now with super heavy and what that's going to be able to launch over and above what say the ariane is launching with the james webb you know we could be holding a whole new era of very very intense deep space observational astronomy and this is what I, I find fascinating about this. We're still reliant so much on not old technology, but the Hubble obviously is is now quite aged technology and almost failed a few months ago. You know, had the gold computer go down. So 
Yeah, it's oh, I love I love stories like this. They just they really bend your mind when you think yeah. what's happening here. <laughs> it's just it's remarkable. But yeah, I love it. Fabulous, great find, great find. Yeah. Terry always finds these great stories. I just love oh, it. No. Yeah. I love it. Right, our next story. I, I like this one as well. Um, this is Inspiration 4. So people who, who've been living under a rock for the last few weeks or months may not have heard about this, but this is the first civilian crew to orbit the Earth. Now, um, what's remarkable about that is that this you know entrepreneurial um, inspiration for Shift 4 Payment CEO guy called Jared uh, Isaacman, he basically funded the whole mission. Now, it's interesting today listening to the United Nations Secretary General talking about, you know, billionaires in space and how disgusting that is. You know, Branson and Bezos, you know, billionaires going up on little joyrides into space when there's millions of people starving around the world. And you could say, well, again, this is just another space jolly, but it isn't. It really did a lot of good. The, the whole aim of this was not only to inspire people. Uh, hence the name of the mission, but also to raise vast amounts of money for uh, childhood cancer research at St. Jude's in America. And I mean, St. Jude's Hospital is aiming to raise about 200 million. I think you know, they're well on the way with that now because of this mission. Um, so Jared Isaac Money basically uh, bought up four seats, took one himself, let three go to other people. One of the people, uh, Sean Proctor, somebody I know quite well, um, fantastic lady, done some amazing outreach and obviously hopefully will continue to do outreach as well. Uh, Hayley Arkansas, hopefully I pronounced the name correctly, she's a physician assistant who worked at St. Jude's. Uh, she had bone cancer herself, so it really is quite an inspirational mission, I think. And yeah, there were so many people went for this. It shows you that the interest in space is, is huge. There were 72,000 people applied for this mission. Uh, from all over the place and it was kind of a bit of a lottery a bit of a down selection and then you know looking at what these people could deliver as it were now if you think about this putting a civilian crew up into space there was a lot of debate on various web forums facebook forums like space hipsters and other forums saying well they're not astronauts well they are astronauts i think in this case they are and i'll kind of hopefully justify this now you look at what happened with Bezos and Virgin Galactic? Now, the people who flew on those missions, now, whether or not you say they crossed the common line or not, as to them qualifying for their, their astronaut wings, that's a whole other debate. We'll leave that one aside. They were passengers in a spacecraft, and they did practically nothing in that spacecraft bar, basically provide themselves as test articles. It was almost like the early days of the Mercury astronauts, where they were nicknamed Spam in a Can, as Terry said uh, just before we went on air. Now, it's true, you'd watch the movie The Right Stuff, and that's how they saw themselves. These guys were extremely accomplished test pilots, uh, the Mercury 7, as were all of the Apollo astronauts, and they trained for months, years, um, you know, to to do what they did, even though in some cases, the early Mercury flights in particular, it was pretty much autonomous. It was just up and down um, until it went into orbit, obviously, and the likes of John Glenn, etc. cetera. Um, now, with Bezos and Virgin Galactic, as I said, if I get on a plane, I'm not the pilot. I'm a passenger. I'm not a pilot. I am a passenger on an aircraft. So if I sit in a capsule and I'm shot up and I you know, go around the Earth once or come back down straight on a suborbital, I'm still a passenger. I may have gone into space, but I'm still a passenger. So maybe there needs to be a term like astronauts or whatever to qualify what these people do. With this mission, they were trained. They were trained for months. They were trained in orbital dynamics. They were trained in emergency escape procedures, emergency flight procedures, takeover procedures in case anything went wrong. Uh, Isaac Mann himself is a qualified jet pilot. So these are not people who were just up for a jolly. They orbited the Earth. It's the first time a civilian crew's been up, you know, from US soil since STS-2 uh, with Joe Engel, who was an X-15 pilot. Uh, he's still the only surviving uh, member of the X-15 test pilot crew, an amazing guy. And he flew the space shuttle with um, Truly uh, on STS-2 just after Crippen and Young had done STS-1. And again, that was you know, complete risk. But the first rookie crew, as it were, the first kind of not been into space before crew that, you know, that's been off US soil since 1981, 82. Um, some of the, I think Shenzhou 7 in 2008 was the last time the Chinese did it with an all rookie crew. Um, but it was it was quite a risk. I mean, you say space is easy and SpaceX tend to make things look very easy. Uh, now the launches, the cadence, uh, you know, frequency of the launches is so 
quick. The turnaround is so quick, and they're aiming to make that even faster with the likes of you know super heavy, etc. But it's so fast now, and they've become so reliable. Apart from obviously some of the testing that they're still doing, where things are still blowing up. But with the Falcon series, it is incredibly reliable. Um, but it's not easy. Things can still go wrong. You know, you only have to watch The Martian, the movie, to see what happens when a Falcon does go wrong. That was real footage of a Falcon disintegrating with uh, some really nice food on it, apparently, as well. And a, a, a British chef called Heston Blumenthal had prepared. Uh, but we won't go into that. But it can still go wrong. So these people are still putting their lives on the line. And to go through all of that training, I think they do actually qualify as astronauts in this case. I don't know what you think, Terry, but that's kind of my justification for this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the missions now, as we we're saying, uh, up to the ISS are almost entirely automated. But you wouldn't say that the guys that are going up uh, to dock with the ISS are not astronauts, even though the computer is doing most of it. If things go wrong, they have the training and the ability to do everything manually. Um, the same applied to this crew. Uh, fortunately, they didn't need to, uh, to do that. Everything worked. Although apparently there was a bit of a problem with the toilet, which is everybody's favorite <laughs> sub subject <laughs> about uh, what do you do in space. Apparently there was a bit of a problem with the, the suction for the, the toilet device, but they got it sorted. The right stuff, they could even fix toilets, never mind anything else. Well, let's find... be honest, it's the only question they're <laughs> going to be asked for the next 20 years. Probably. <laughs> uh, what I found fascinating was that they went so high up, much higher mm. than the ISS, higher even yeah. than the Hubble Space Telescope. They were up at a height of 585 kilometers, 363 miles. The interesting thing about that is if their retro rocket had failed to fire, they were stuck there. They couldn't even dock yeah. with the ISS and stay there for a while uh, until something was sorted out. The only thing that could go and get them would basically have been another Falcon rocket. And I yeah. They had two already in space, so I don't know if they had yet another one. So it was a, a bit of a risk doing that. Uh, but it also meant basically that they were getting a fantastic view of the Earth. When you're on the ISS, you see sort of a almost like flying in a very high air airplane, except higher, basically. But you cannot see the whole of the Earth because you're not high enough up above it. They were far enough up not to be able to see the whole Earth, but definitely to see it as a sphere. So, sorry, mm -hmm. flat earthers. These are not uh, NASA or ESA or whoever uh, paid people keeping quiet about the fact that the Earth is flat. These are civilians. If you get a chance to ask them, they will tell you it definitely is round. Also meant they were coming in at a, quite a high re-entry speed, yeah. which uh, would have been quite spectacular. You don't want to think about what happens if the parachute doesn't open. As you were saying, you know, sometimes it makes it, it uh, look easy but there are things that can go wrong and when they go wrong in space they go very wrong but i think it was a fantastic achievement and uh, very well done once again elon musk love him hate him this was a good one it, it was and as you said you know the apogee and perigee the the altitude that they got to i mean em1 that um test mission that was flown on a delta on a delta heavy a few years back uh, which was the first time I think in my lifetime I'd seen anything like an Apollo capsule splash down in the ocean. And that was an uncrewed flight. But again, the onboard cameras on that were showing, you know, what was possible when you're talking about those kind of altitudes. They didn't quite get up to that altitude. But as you said, the, the entry velocity, this was this was risky in so mm -hmm. many respects. You know, as you said, if the parachutes fell, and you look, we, we're going to be talking about the Chinese mission in a while. You know, the parachutes on the early Mercury flights and some of these later Chinese flights as well, they only have one parachute. They'll probably have a backup or reserve. But you look at the Apollo spacecraft, on Apollo 15 in particular, uh, when that was coming back in, one of the parachutes failed. And they had built this system redundancy in that if one of the chutes failed, they would still splash down at a safe velocity. But if you, if you look at you know one parachute failing that can be really catastrophic even if you've got two parachutes and one fails again it can be quite catastrophic and it depends if you're landing on the ocean if you if you're on land and even with bezos and his last minute and the soyuz obviously with its last minute firing with retro boosters just before it hits the ground which makes it look like it's kind of puffing up a, a big cloud of smoke but it is literally just to decelerate it quite rapidly at the at the last split second um Things like that go wrong, and you're going from a, a really nice kind of gentle touchdown to being in a car crash, in effect. Mm -hmm. So it's, it took a lot of guts, and I think for people who had no formal astronaut training to go from being selected, you know, just a short while ago, six months plus ago, 
to flying on a mission that the altitude, as you said, had never been achieved by a crewed mission in, you know, since the Gemini era or the Apollo era in particular, uh, took some gut, I think. Mm -hmm. So definite hat tip. And as you said, love or hate him, yeah, he pulled off a good, it was a good one, this, and it raised a truckload of money. So, yeah, um, for, for a very good cause. So, he personally yeah. gave 50 million, apparently, Elon Musk. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so you know, small change to him, but still, it's a big amount for a hospital. Small change to him, but then at least he's not trying to sue NASA and sue everyone else like uh, yeah. the richest man alive is trying to do right now. But anyway, uh, moving on, moving on to another happy story. So, um, over to you, Terry. Yeah, uh, the Chinese space program, uh, space program just continues to fascinate and amaze. We're so used to NASA being the leader and the Russians whenever uh, they were doing things and the limited amount of uh, information we got from them. And then ESA, with, particularly with their science uh, program and so on. But now China is really catching up with everybody else. Uh, for political reasons, which I'm not going to go into, basically they are not to particip allowed to participate in the ISS. America says so. America basically calls the shots on this one. So they built their own space station uh, called Shan Shanwei, I think is the pronunciation, which means harmony of the heavens. Now, this crew went up for uh, 90 days. That's longer than uh, three times longer than any previous Chinese crew. Not as long as your average stint on the ISS, but they're in early days yet. Uh, they went up spent the 90 days there doing research and testing the systems and so on, and then splashed down uh, very safely in the Gobi Desert. I'm only going to use their first names because I don't think I can pronounce the surnames properly, so apologies to them. But Ni, Liu and Tang had a successful flight. Uh, it actually took three days for them to come back because they made it uh, sort of a, a multi-stage process. On Wednesday last, they detached from the space station. Then they did a rendezvous, another test rendezvous with their space station just to test systems on the Thursday. And then they uh, came away from that and uh, did the full day orbit and touched down on Friday. All told a very successful mission. And of course, it's only the start. <clears throat> The existing station is much, much smaller than the ISS. It's only about 54 uh, feet or 16.6 .6 meters long. But as I say, it's early days. They're going to be sending up another two modules to uh, dock with it and make a sort of a, a, a tripart, like a trimaran space station. The next crew is due to go up in mid-October. We don't know the exact date yet because they generally don't give us uh, a lot of detail. Uh, and uh, that new... Uh, bigger developed space station is going to be called Shangong, which is a name that has already been used with previous satellites, which have now been uh, deorbited and burned up. But that means Heavenly Palace. And I think basically it's just a case of watch this space with China. Um, we have talked before about the first people on Mars. I would not be at all surprised if the first people on Mars are actually Chinese. There's a lot going on there that uh, we don't fully know about, but certainly what they're doing, they have a very high success rate. Uh, first attempt to uh, get a rover on the surface of Mars, successful. First landing on the far side of the moon, successful. The other rovers that they sent on to the moon, successful. They have a very good success rate, and uh, I say, as a matter of watch this space, they, they are going forward by leaps and bounds. Yeah, the engineering quality is is proving to be exceptional, and again, I've been saying this, and you know about this, Terry, as well, I've been saying this for years, their whole trajectory is really following the early days of NASA, with, you know, up, down, very simple flights, aka Mercury, then moving forward onto more complex flights, you know, multi-astronaut flights, docking in space, etc., they're now almost at their Skylab kind of moment. They've done yeah. their lunar landing, um, as you said, very successfully on the far side of the moon and, you know, also developing a relay station. We'll be talking about that a bit more in a while. Um, but now they're kind of almost looking at what America were doing in the early 70s with Skylab, mm -hmm. where you're putting up a, you know, a larger structure in space, perfecting your docking maneuvers, making sure that you've got a working habitat up there to do scientific research or whatever um, they, they intend to do up there. I I don't know. I think it's more going to be a space race between China and the commercial entities. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think Musk is going to want to be beaten by anybody when it comes to getting to Mars. You know, he's been developing everything. All of his technologies have got one singular goal, and that's to put human beings on the surface of Mars. That's what he continually says. So if China can exceed that and can surpass what he's doing, 
all power to them. But uh, I just look at that capsule in the picture and think three days, and that's just mm. not, that's about the size of a Soyuz. And you look at the design of it. China are, as we know from many areas of commercial activity, are extremely good. The Chinese manufacturers are extremely good at looking at ideas that may have been developed in the West and then copying them, but doing in many respects a better job in in some areas. Um, I know in the astronomy world, the amateur telescopes, you know, Skywatcher, mm -hmm. for example, massive Chinese brand. When they first came out, the the big guns like Mead and Celestron, et cetera, were saying, oh, well, you know, they're just some cheap Chinese copy. And the same with the lenses and the optics and the telescopes. Now, everybody uses them because they're so good and they're so reliable. Every Pretty much everyone I know uses Skywatcher mounts and their telescopes are extremely good. And Celestron are now owned by a Chinese company and Mead have gone bust. So, um all power to, to what China are doing, I can say. Um, it, it's just a shame there's still the ongoing political tensions, especially mm. now with what's happening with the submarines, for example, in the defense sector, and obviously with the aircraft carriers out in the Indo-Pacific, the uh, Asia-Pacific region. Um, it would just be great if there could be almost like a, as, as Biden was saying at the United Nations today, the diplomacy needs to take over, you know, saber rattling, etc. We don't need that. We've proved with space we can live and survive and work in very close harmony, even with our sworn enemies. In the case of Russia, and you only have to look at what's happened today with Russia and the Salisbury poisonings. And, yeah, the British government's still got major issues with anything to do with the Russians. But the ISS is proving time and again that we can cooperate and we can collaborate and we can do great scientific work. So I just hope that that, that, that continues and you know, let's see what China do. Like you said, watch yeah. this space. So on to watching this space, um, more like listening to this space. So this is an interesting story. We all know that the uh, space launch system, the SLS, the Boeing is now pretty much getting ready in the vehicle assembly building, the VAB, um, vertical assembly building, vehicle assembly building, whichever one you want to call it, um, largest single story structure pretty much on the planet, um, formerly home to the Apollo Saturn Vs uh, and now to the SLS uh, space launch system, which is around about the same size, a little bit smaller than Saturn V, using uh, kind of refurbished, repurposed, slightly made different um, solid rocket boosters from the shuttle era, like this candle and hope. Um, not a big fan of that, but there we go. But that's what they're going to be using for boosting. That's all coming together quite nicely now. Um, there's still issues with Boeing and their CST-100 in terms of you know, their elements of that, and there's still obviously massive overruns with Boeing on the SLS. Um, Lockheed Martin with the Orion module, they pretty much delivered that. Um, now it's all kind of being fitted on, and we should be looking at a launch within the next few years, we hope, which will be a test launch, uncrewed test launch, going to the moon, circumnavigating the moon, coming back just to prove all the systems are there, and then the second one, hopefully, to put people either into lunar orbit depending on the success of the first mission or maybe even a touchdown and that's the whole battle that's going on at the moment between bezos and musk and you know the whole lawsuits and what have you anyway the happy spin-off story from this is that britain waving our flag here um via the european space agency and sstl which is sorry satellites uh, who are well known for developing you know I think it's about 30 or 40 percent of all of the small sats in the world uh, you know developed in the uk and sstl are a big part of that um part of airbus the big airbus group and obviously airbus have got decades of heritage in flight avionics and what have you they've won the contract to develop the relay system for the lunar gateway so having communications accurate communications and don't forget with these lunar missions they're not aiming for safe sites like we had with apollo where you know you're in you know, the earth obviously and the moon are tidally locked so the same face of the moon is always facing towards us, a little bit of wobble called libration. But essentially, all the landing sites from that era were on that side of the moon. With the first attempted missions, they're going for the South Pole, they're going for the Aitken Basin. Now, this is going to be complex anyway, because the Aitken Basin, um, it's, you know, it's, some of it's in shadow. You've got potentially water ices there. It's going to be a really interesting geological and scientific mission. But they need accurate relay capability. They can't have what happened with the Apollo era when the Apollo um, command modules were orbiting the moon. Whenever they went around the far side of the moon, they lost all contact with the Earth. And you, you talked to the flight controllers, and it was a nerve-wracking time. They they got it precisely, you know, precisely right in terms of they knew when the egress and egress times were going to be. They knew exactly when they were going to be coming out. But if something goes wrong and you're on the, the far side of the moon, you know, you have a booster stuck or something like on the Gemini mission with Dave Scott and Neil Armstrong where, you know, it went into a, you know, almost an uncontrollable spin. If something like that happened on the far side of the moon, 
you want to know that you can at least communicate that. So it's a really good moment, I think, for Britain. And you've got other companies like Tyler's Alenia, who are a European company, but very heavy base up near you, Terry, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, mm. A lot of great research that's going on with those guys as well in terms of Lunar Gateway. And, you know, the whole thing with Lunar Pathfinder mission and what's going up here, you know, NASA aiming Sorry, to... Sorry, Nick, you've just frozen. Have I frozen? Can you see me, hear me? I can see you. Oh, I yeah, yeah. On now. Yep. Cool. Yeah, with the Lunar Pathfinder, NASA are aiming to put a rover on the surface of the moon in the next few years, obviously to do lots of testing, etc., which is exactly what they did with Apollo uh, and putting Pathfinder missions ahead. So it's a really proud moment, I'd say, for SSTL and the British involvement in this. And, you know, there's a lot of British science goes into you know, space exploration anyway, the James Webb, we touched a bit on that late earlier when we were talking about the supernova, one of the principal instruments on that, MIRI, was developed in the UK. Um, so there is a lot of flag waving, a lot of pride, and especially now that we uh, finally got rid of the science minister that we used to have, um, who, yeah, my thoughts on that, um, on our former science minister, well-known and well-documented, uh, we now have a science minister who understands science, which is good. Um, so hopefully more of that to come. Yep. Just a wee bit more about the, the actual mission itself. <clears throat> it's called VIPER, which stands for Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, which basically means it's looking for lunar ice, which is frozen water, as we all know. Why is that important? Well, obviously, if you're going to spend any time on the moon, uh, you need both water and oxygen, and you can break down water into uh, oxygen and hydrogen. That gives you options for fuel as well. So basically, any prolonged stay on the moon needs a source of water. And the only place you find water, except perhaps deep down below the surface, but the only place that we know for sure that it's there is in what are called permanently shadows areas near the north and south pole of the moon, particularly the south pole, where in parts of the craters, the sun never actually shines on the surface. And so it won't evaporate or sublimate any of the ice that's there. <coughs> They've um, detected this by various orbiters and so on, and we know it's there. Not sure quite how much, but almost certainly enough to, to do for the first uh, several decades of, of lunar exploration. So this rover is going to land in a crater called Nobile, N-O-B-I-L-E. Uh, it's going to explore an area of about 36 square miles on the western side of that crater, which, as you say, is within the, the much larger Aiken Basin area of the moon, uh, exploring for water which is probably trapped basically in uh, the dust on the surface layer. Uh, maybe actually little patches of ice that, that are actually exposed, but we're not sure. So it's to launch in 2023, and um, it's to, the primary mission is to last 100 days, and this will be an essential precursor for a permanent uh, manned uh, mission on the moon, a, a, a lunar, uh, basically a base, uh, which would need the water. So that's an, a very important step to go there. And it's great, as you say, to see all the local involvement in that. Absolutely. And the crew, uh, crewed missions, obviously, you know, the, the plan to send crews to the moon in the next few years, one of the key elements, and this is part of the scientific research, is the ability to utilize the resources that are on the moon. So lunar regolith, if anyone has ever played with lunar soil, I've got some lunar meteorites behind me. Uh, the lunar regolith and the lunar soil is horrible. It's a nasty, nasty, you know, kind of very abrasive, um, very unpleasant um, kind of substance to play with or to touch. And, you know, some of the Apollo astronauts were still picking this stuff out of the fingernails and out of the, out of the fingertips for weeks after the missions had ended. Um, really, and it stuck to the suits. You only have to go to the Smithsonian and look at some of the, the space suits from any of the Apollo missions, and they're still caked in dust. This stuff was horrible. But the one plus side of this is with modern 3D printing technology and some of the technologies that are being developed now and this, you know, the ability to extract potentially, as you said, water from the surface as well. And then in effect, use the regolith that you've got around you as a 3D printing substrate material is going to be vital. Being able to utilize the, the resources that are there. It's like you know, the early days of exploration anywhere in the world when, you know, the Vikings going back into the 8 and 900s or the early settlers, you know, in, in the 14, 1500s, uh, people needed to be able to utilize the resources that they had. And obviously on the earth, you've got everything. You've got woods, you've got materials, you've got animals, you've got water. On the lunar surface, you've got regolith and some water. So 
if you can utilize that to the best of your capability by converting it into something, either fuel, taking you know, hydrogen and oxygen from the water, for example, or converting the regolith into suitable structures, or at least using it for potentially parts of the radiation hardening that's going to be needed. Because if you're living on the lunar surface, you need radiation shielding. Because um, you can't walk around, obviously, you need a full spacesuit. The spacesuit's going to have to be radiation shielded as well. But if you're inside a habitat, that's going to need to for any duration of time. Don't forget the Apollo missions were only there for a few days. And you know, if you had a major solar storm occur during the Apollo era, they'd have all died. But thankfully, apart from Apollo 17 on the way back, there wasn't anything major that happened in terms of radiation exposure. Um, so there's a lot that's still going to be done with the lunar surface. I think the estimate of 2024 was always pie in the sky. I think by the end of the decade, yes, we may see boots on the ground on the lunar surface. Um, hopefully women, hopefully, you know, every kind of representation of humanity on Earth will go there this time, not just a bunch of test pilots. Um, so let's again just keep watching this space and, and see what's happening. Um, watching this space is also the topic of our next story. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a, a constant bugbear and something I keep bringing up um, on this show and keep mentioning on social media, etc., because it is such an important issue. And we talk about climate and the climate disaster that's happening, and you know the accelerating climate crisis, and we've now got you know energy crises due to you know, gas prices etc all coming to a head um obviously we're just getting through covid but we've still got a pandemic and most of the world's still not being vaccinated so there's all these issues still going on and above our heads is the biggest one uh which is space debris which is mounting and mounting and mounting and now what it seems like is the u.s department of defense and the u.s government who are responsible for most of the debris that went up there up until about probably 15 years ago uh, when the commercial companies started getting interested and now you've got Elon Musk checking up satellites, hundreds of satellites a month. Um, the Department of Defence have said, well, this space debris problem, it is a big problem. I know from the UK Ministry of Defence and discussions you know, we're having and you know, my company are having with, with various entities in that fray, um, it's a big problem. It's a major, ha major headache um, from a defense perspective. If things all start colliding, then you lose your defense capability. From a communications perspective, it's catastrophic. From a banking perspective, it's catastrophic. From a communications and television or you know entertainment perspective, it's catastrophic. Um, the cost estimate of the, the so-called Kessler syndrome happening is in the trillions of dollars if it all goes really, really wrong. Now, what the US Department of Defense have said, uh, Major General Deanna Burt, basically, who's a vice commander of Space Force or Space Operations Command in the United States, basically said that, yeah, we need to pick up the debris, but we can't do it. So what they're looking for is trash trucks or garbage, garbage cans or garbage trucks in space. Now, what, what there's, what's been said is that they're saying, we're not going to do it because if you imagine the the cold war slash um defense implications of this if you've got a say russian or chinese or north korean or whatever spy satellite uh, a, com a country that's nominally a, an enemy of nato or a, of a friendly force so you've got one of their spy satellites and it's gone wrong and it's become a piece of debris but it's not that old if you've then got a u.s department of defense or u.s government entity i.e another satellite going up to it like Northrop grumman did with the mev and you know the mev 2 project and they boosted a, an old satellite into a higher orbit and basically revived it but if you were to do that it could almost be seen as a declaration of war because you're effectively trying to tap into potentially it's how people could see it what's on board that satellite which is for most most intents and purposes, in, entirely confidential. We're not supposed to know what the Russians are doing or what the Chinese are doing. They're not supposed to know what we're doing. So you've got things like the X-37B, the little mini space shuttle that goes up, and the US Department of Defense and DARPA put payloads on this. They're the Defense Research Projects arm of, of the US Department of Defense. And they'll put projects in there, and they'll do their whatever they're doing, and then they'll come down, and nobody's any the wiser. Nobody knows what's going on. But if you've got garbage trucks in space, even if their intentions are good, collecting other large satellites, the potential for them to understand what the technologies and systems are on those satellites by a close approach using cameras and whatever other sensors you want to put on it, is, is it can't be done. 
So what the US are saying is that they want commercial companies to do this. So you've got the likes of, um, sorry, satellites. We go back to them. You know, they provided demonstrators, which frankly were a bit hokey with the net and the harpoon. You've got Astroscale, who've recently successfully put out a small piece of debris deliberately from their own spacecraft and then retrieves it, which is very, very cool. But there are 130 to 170 million pieces of debris up there. And you're not going to clean that up. It's just not going to happen. There needs to be some completely different mind shift when it comes to how you clear the debris. So saying we're going to send up you know, commercial spacecraft to chomp up a bit of space debris, all well and good. But in the early 1960s, the US government chucked up thousands of needles into space to make mm -hmm. a fake ionosphere. Um, and hundreds of thousands of them, they're still up there. The gloves from the Gemini, you know, you only have to look at Ed White, the glove floating away into space. All that stuff's still up there. It's still floating around, mostly. Um, so what you do about that is a whole other thing. And for the US government to say, well, yeah, we made it, but somebody else can clear it up, which is effectively what they're saying. Um, yes, there's a need. We get that. And I understand, you know, working in this sector that the implications for a defense organization doing this are enormous. But there needs to be some more joined up thinking here. And it you know, small companies like Space Logistics, Astra Scale, Sony Satellites, etc., are all working on this problem. There's no real joined up thinking. Everyone's thinking, well, I can do this and I can charge. I mean, what they're looking at is, you know, if you want your piece of debris removing, if you've got a large satellite that's now defunct, um, we'll we'll do it for X million dollars. So big company pays small company X million dollars. They do a launch. If that launch goes wrong, they've created more debris. If anything goes wrong with the retrieval, they've created more debris. If they fire something at it and it breaks up a piece of the satellite, they've created more debris. So it's a big problem. And unlike plastic in the oceans, which is traveling at around about four and a half to five knots, four and a half, five miles an hour, six miles an hour, whatever, um, you can scoop that up. And we've still got a massive problem with plastic in the ocean that we can't, you know, can't solve. Um, this stuff in space is traveling at eight kilometers a second. So hmm, what do you do? Thoughts, Terry? I've ranted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I know I would rant about it too. Yeah, I think we're largely stuck with the stuff that's up there. As you say, there are just too many pieces for any conceivable enterprise to bring down. Eventually, they'll come down, especially as we're coming up to solar maximum, hopefully in the next four or five years. And that makes the Earth's atmosphere expand a bit. And that will certainly help to clear away any of the stuff that's in relatively low orbit. Mm -hmm. The stuff that's up a bit higher and is, is going to stay there for the next couple of decades, maybe half century or century. I don't think anything can be done about it, except maybe if you tackle the big ones and hope um, certainly any that are in, in orbits that are uh, in danger of colliding with another reasonably big one, take those ones out. The small bits, you're just going to have to take the risk. But it is basically responsibility of whoever launched the satellite. And uh, you'd hope that the, the major players are, are uh, reasonably responsible, except they haven't been up to now. But then when you consider that, for example, China deliberately blew up a satellite and caused... Uh, and the Indians, and the Americans, and, yeah, to be fair, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was further back. China, China. I think I'm right in saying they were the last ones to do it. Yeah, so, in uh, India with the ACE, India's well, ACE test, right, okay. yeah. Well, recently, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, you're right, you're right. We were well aware of the problem by that stage, and that should not have happened, absolutely not have happened. No. Uh, there are all sorts of ways, as you say, of, of tackling individual satellites, something the size of a, from a, a microwave up to the size of a car or something like that. But all the smaller bits, you have, you have no hope of retrieving them all. And I think the best that we can hope for is that every satellite, everything that is sent up from now on has some way of either boosting itself into a higher safe orbit or safely deorbiting. Nothing should be launched into space now unless it has that capability. And well, as for dealing with the existing problem, that is just going to be an ongoing major issue. There's other Sorry. there's other problems as well though, Terry. I mean, one of the things I've kind of been advocating for for quite some time is that if the central computer, the OBC, the onboard computer on the satellite fails and the power systems fail, for example, if it gets hit by debris on the solar, solar arrays and then the batteries die, what tends to happen is that your only tracking then is from the ground. You've got, you know, this vast array. You've got companies like Exo Analytics. You've got 400 telescopes dotted around the world. And you've got these telescope arrays that can pick up the light from these objects. So anything above about 5 to 10 centimeters you can track. Um, to some degree. 
But then what they do is they generate what's called TLEs, two-line element data. And then mm. the TLEs, basically the satellites follow those, but then they kind of drift out of them. So you've got to update the TLEs. And then the TLEs accuracy can be out by kilometers. Now, if it's out by kilometers with a, a ship in the ocean, you know, radar, whatever's going to pick that up and you can move the ship. At eight kilometers a second, if you're out by kilometers, you've got no idea. And also the orientation of the satellite, you have in many cases, no idea. You don't even know the state of the satellite. There could be little fragments of debris falling off it. Then if you're trying to retrieve it and get up to it, as Astroscale demonstrating, they've got some really good videos actually showing this. The satellites could be tumbling and they could be tumbling at terrific rates. Now, if you've got a tumbling object, how do you latch onto it? The idea mm -hmm. of the net, you know, I just don't like that idea. I think it's really, really silly. The electromagnetic idea, the electromagnetic sever is one thing, but then most of these spacecraft are aerospace grade aluminium, mm -hmm. uh, which <laughs> magnetics, aluminium. Um, so they're designed to kind of avoid a lot of these problems with electrical fields and magnetic fields, etc. If you've got a tumbling multi-ton in the case of something like Envisat, that's the size of a bus mm -hmm. satellite. If that was to go pop, you know, if the batteries were to explode or something was to fail in that or a piece of debris were to hit it or a micrometeorite were to hit it, you know, the amount of debris that would come just from that one satellite is absolutely astonishing. There was a test. We've talked about this on the show before, but, you know, you said about the size of a fridge or a microwave. Um, the University of Florida did a test on a small kind of satellite around about the size of a small fridge. And they hit it with something the size of a Coke can or a can, a can of fizzy drink at seven kilometers a second. That thing generated over 100,000 pieces of debris. It's it's just astonishing, absolutely astonishing. So, um, yeah, there we go. Let's let's see what happens um, with this. But, I mean, the U.S. government seems to be saying, mm. and then you only have to look at where were China with this? China were doing such advanced research, as we just showed with you know their space station. But they seem to have shown absolutely no interest whatsoever in orbital debris and the same mm -hmm. with the russians they've shown no interest in orbital debris so it's left to a few small western and japanese companies like astroscale etc and the united states to clear up this mess now to be fair a lot of the mess is american mess you only have to look at the uni uh, ucs database there's a lot of u.s satellites up there but there's a lot of old soviet satellites up there. there's a lot of old chinese satellites up there so uh, let's see what happens anyway Move on to something happier. <laughs> that's, your se that's your second favorite subject. Yeah. Uh, the sky. Back to the sky. Back to um, the sky. Tomorrow is one of the four significant dates in the, the annual calendar, as far as astronomers are concerned, the equinox, when the sun will cross the uh, equator going from north to south. Uh, tomorrow then, if you're on the equator, the sun will be exactly overhead at your local noon. And equinox means not equal night, but short for that, if you like. It actually means the time when, uh, in theory, it's equal day and equal night. Nox being the night, but the day bit of it is left out. But it's not as simple as that. Sunrise and sunset are not defined as when the center of the sun is on the horizon. It's when the upper edge or the upper limb, as astronomers call it, of the sun is on the horizon. And that means that a day is actually slightly longer. So if you imagine when the sun is rising in the east, as soon as the very first top bit of the sun appears above the horizon, that's defined as sunrise. And then at the end of the day, as it's setting, it's not sunset whenever the lower edge of the, the sun touches the horizon. Sunset is defined as when the upper edge of the sun finally disappears below the, the, the true theoretical horizon. So that adds actually quite a few minutes, depends on where you are, other factors involved, quite a few minutes to the length of the day. There's also another factor called refraction. The lower something is down in uh, the, the skies we see it here from Earth, the greater the amount of the Earth's atmosphere that its light has to pass through to reach us. And this takes us back to the gravitational effect, uh, or sorry, lensing effect. This time it's optical refraction rather than gravitational refraction. And that means that when you look at the sun as it's near the horizon, it actually appears higher up than it really is. In fact, at the moment when the sun has completely appeared above the horizon as we see it, actually it is still below the horizon. If we had no atmosphere, that 
you would not be seeing the sun there at all. So when you add to those two effects together, they actually make a day, and this is specifically for here, UK, Ireland, on the equinox tomorrow, the day will not be exactly 12 hours long, it will be 12 hours 11 minutes long, and the night of uh, the following night, uh, tomorrow night, will actually be 11 hours 49 minutes long. So that means, in effect, even though it's the equinox, the day tomorrow will be 20 minutes longer than the night. And the same thing, of course, happens with the spring equinox. But it's one of those little quirks in astronomy where things seem simple, but when you look into it in a bit more detail, uh, they're just not so simple. But it's very educational. For example, the refraction effect is a very significant effect. Uh, if you're an astronomer and you're looking for the position of something actually in the sky, it's not until it gets up above about 40 degrees, 45 degrees above the horizon, that the effect of refraction becomes more or less negligible. So that that's all factored into your computer programs and so on. Whenever you're, you're looking for a, an object in the sky, the computer allows for the amount of refraction that's there. Uh, but it also tells us, of course, about the seasons, the fact that the, the tilt of the Earth's equator to the uh, ecliptic, the path of the, the sun around the sky as we see it from Earth, is tilted at 23 and a half degrees. Whenever the North Pole of the Earth is tilted towards the sun, that's our summer. Whenever the South Pole is uh, tilted towards the sun, that's their summer and our winter. So. We take it for granted, the equinox maybe doesn't get quite as much attention as the summer and winter solstices, but very educational. But it's not just a matter of equal day and equal night. Over to you, Nick. Um, yeah, the, the way I know about this, um, for anyone who knows me, knows I live quite near to Avebury, uh, which is one of the big stone circles. So uh, international listeners and viewers uh, may have heard of Stonehenge. Stonehenge is like this world famous uh, monolith, a set of you know, megaliths around in a circle with lintels over the top. Um, about one mile away from my house is another one called Avery, which is even larger than Stonehenge, but doesn't have the famous kind of uh, cross lintels as, well, as it were. And every year, um, regular as clockwork, four times a year, so winter equinox, uh, winter solstice, summer solstice, and then the two equinoxes, uh, we get thousands and thousands of people descending on the area and making parking a real problem but yes kind of it's a good way to remind yourself that uh, these things are happening um it's a great as i said it's one of those great fun things if you're if you've got kids in particular you're getting them into astronomy and you think about in the era before the telescope when you know the ancient peoples were just looking up at the sky and making notes of the procession of the planets and looking at where the planets were and these strange objects comets appearing in the sky and seen as harbingers of doom and then you know, working out that if the sun rose at this point, they'd be able to put, you know, marker stones in to show them when they could plant their crops or they could do you know, a specific thing or would help them understand the, you know, the the Nile, for example, you know, ancient Egypt and when the Nile was going to flood. All of these things were based upon astronomical observations and calculations. So it may seem like a really trivial thing, but it's a beautiful example of not only orbital dynamics and you know some of newton's laws in terms of gravity etc but it's just a wonderful way of kind of explaining and showing the motion of our pale blue dot around the sun uh it, you know it sounds really simple and really trivial but it isn't it's it's a nice one i'd say yep Moving well, on just on. On. yeah Okay, very nicely actually to the next topic, looking up at what's in the sky at the moment. And yeah. we've just talked about the equinox and we also talked about the moon. And you probably noticed if you're out looking at the sky at all over the last day or two, it was full moon, the harvest moon. The harvest moon is defined as the full moon that occurs nearest to the autumn equinox. And it's significant, it was certainly far more significant in older times when we didn't have so much artificial lighting. And that basically it gave some extra light for the farmers if they were trying to get in their crops before they, the rain came. Uh, full moon actually can give you a significant amount of light. And if your light, eyes are dark adapted, you can actually harvest crops and so on. So the full moon that occurs nearest to the autumn equinox is called the, the harvest moon and still a very popular name. Other things to look out for, we mentioned before the International Space Station, although only by comparison, but by just by chance, it is doing a lovely series of evening passes over the UK and Ireland. 
tends to happen, uh, except in the middle of the summer, that you see it either in the evening just after sunset or in the mornings just before sunrise. And unless you're an early riser, the evening ones are better. And we're in a, a lovely series of very, very good passes at the moment. Whole lot of ways to find out just when you'll see it. Uh, there's a Heavens Above website is very good. There's apps you can get on your phone, which will simply tell you exactly when it will appear over where you are at the, at the time and what direction to look and so on. Uh, it is absolutely amazing that this thing weighing over 100 tonnes of the size of a football field is whizzing around up there 17,500 miles an hour. Uh, I, I love watching it. You know, you only see a very, very bright point of light, sometimes far brighter than Jupiter at its very best, not quite as bright as Venus, well, but did, certainly. Did you see the picture of the multiple dragons, Terry? When they oh, had yeah, multiple yeah. Dragons? yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's again, it's fascinating yeah. to yeah. just think what's Yeah, up there. you can sometimes see one of the other spacecraft uh, approaching it to dock mm. with it, not just at the moment, but yeah, that's another thing to look out for. And as well as that, we have Jupiter. Uh, not only is it fascinating because it's the largest uh, object in the solar system apart from our sun, uh, still prominent, uh, quite high up uh, at a reasonable hour now that it's just past opposition. Have a look at it with binoculars or a telescope. One of the most fascinating things is that there was a very significant observation by an amateur astronomer who was recording Jupiter by video, and he recorded the impact of a body on Jupiter, either an asteroid or a comet. Uh, it showed up as a bright flash visible on the surface in the video. And if you Google it or uh, um, you know, use your favorite search engine, whatever, you'll find that you can see a, li a little video of a flash actually, actually happening or see the, the actual photograph of it. We don't know the size of the object. It didn't leave a permanent mark on Jupiter, unlike the impact of uh, the various pieces of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, which left scars on the surface. Well, the surface of the cloud top, I should say, many times bigger than the Earth. This particular flash actually showed up at approximately the half the size of the Earth. If that had hit us, it would have been a very significant <laughs> event. <Same. laughs> but, yeah, it just shows you that amateur astronomers still are uh, doing stuff of, of real value. No, no professional uh, observatories, as far as I know, recorded that one. So if you've got a reasonable telescope, uh, Jupiter is certainly a thing that's well worth watching. Um, You've got, uh, as well, on, on Jupiter, just to look at it, amazing things like the Great Red Spot, if you have a telescope, which is a gigantic storm system on Jupiter that had lasted for hundreds of years. It's shrinking slowly, but it's still many times bigger than the whole planet Earth. So Jupiter's an absolutely fascinating object. Watching the transits and eclipses and occultations of the satellites uh, used to be one of my, my favorite occupations uh, in my early astronomical career. So it's well worth a look. Nick, I'm sure you're familiar with all those. Absolutely. I mean, my days when I, I, I kind of moved more into comet, cometary observations, galactic observations, etc., with the observatory at the moment. But in the, in the old days, they used to have some quite large McCaspian telescopes. And looking at Jupiter and Saturn was amazing. One of the things I'm really looking forward to, you say about the amateurs, and you've got people like Damien Peach, Christopher Go. Mm. The, there's a, this amateur network all around the world. So you've almost got 24-7 coverage. Now, if you think about it, the professional observatories, you know, they're extremely expensive to run and unless you're specifically looking at something on Jupiter itself. Most of the major telescopes around the world are doing other work. They could be doing sky surveys, they could be looking at, you know, extra galactic objects, whatever. There's very few that are really trained onto the planets in any great detail for long periods of time, even the Hubble. You'll get these spectacular images from the Hubble of Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, Neptune, etc. But it's not its primary goal. Obviously, what it's doing is, is more extra extra galactic kind of research and work. So these amateur networks, and given the quality of the cameras now that the amateurs have got access to, and the quality of the telescopes, and the size of telescopes that amateurs have got access to, because the weight with carbon fiber has brought you know larger telescope sizes down to more manageable levels, as it were, even for portable setups. Um, having this 24 seven network i think is really amazing because as you said you know you've got things like occultations which are very predictable but then these impact events and this isn't the first time this has been picked up by an amateur you know amateurs have detected several impact events now mm -hmm. on the cloud top of jupiter um obviously with shoemaker levy nine you had these residual scars that orbited um on the cloud tops for you know several rotations on jupiter this was just a flash but as you said it was half the size of the earth now what i'm really looking forward to and i I've mentioned this before, but I said it to Damien Peach years ago. 
I'm looking forward to the first image of either an amateur taking an image of an active volcano on Io, mm. or if we're getting Jupiter's gravity is this great big vacuum cleaner for the solar system. Now, we had it with Shoemaker leaving I. There's got to be other objects hitting Jupiter all throughout history. Something hitting one of the moons. Could you imagine, mm -hmm. you know, those moons have been bombarded anyway. Io's resurfacing constantly due to, you know, what's happening with its volcanic activity. But you look at Ganymede, Europa maybe not so much because, again, you've got the ice flows, etc. But Ganymede and Europa, um, you potentially got, you know, moons there that's larger than Mercury in, in one case. So you've got large objects. If you were to hit one of those with an asteroid or a comet, that would be incredible incredible to see both from you know an earth-based observation if it was an amateur that picked it up but then we've obviously still got the juno spacecraft in that mm -hmm. area anyway so being able to do you know a far more detailed detection i'm wondering if juno after seeing that impact possibly they retasked it to look at you know, residuals on the cloud deck in, in much higher detail both with spectroscopy and with the optical side it's it's a fascinating thing it never gets dull jupiter that's that's the beauty of it it's constantly evolving constantly changing some of the images the high resolution images showing the spot size decreasing just over a matter of the last decade or so are uh, incredible to see so um yeah definitely one of the best ones to look out for right now yeah if you've got an impact a significant impact on europa and threw material up um <sighs> and an amateur detected it and alerted all the professionals they would yeah. immediately be um doing spectroscopic analysis and so on of that material it'd be a free yeah. A free show, if you like, of what the surface material of Europa is like. That would be absolutely fantastic uh, observation so get, to make. Uh, it just, again, shows and proves that amateur astronomers are still making viable, valuable contributions to science. So if you've got kids or if you're thinking, oh, I might get into this, it's so much fun. And you can be dedicating, you know, some of your observations to real science. Just as a final thing, just mentioning what we're doing uh, coming up, we're celebrating World Space Week coming up. So WSW is World Space Week. And we've got a bit of a theme going of celebrating uh, the brilliant women in science. I mean, Terry and myself, you know, and a lot of the production crew here at, at Space Store, we're all men, but we, we tend to forget the brilliant females in the scientific community. You look at the Inspiration4 crew and the fact that two of them were female. Um, you, people like Carolyn Porco, Terry knows very well, you know, incredible mission scientist um, with the Cassini mission. Um, you look at the likes of Margaret Hamilton, who's an absolute icon to me, um, one of the people responsible for the Apollo guidance computer, and really, you know, one of the the first ever real software engineers and you know being a software test engineer that's so important so during world space week we're going to be really highlighting on some of the incredible uh, achievements of both women in exploration and science the likes of nicole start eileen collins you know people like that who've paved the way sally ride paving the way for you know female astronauts and you know it took so much time after Tereshkova with with the Russians and Soviet Union in the early 60s through to NASA actually flying a female in space um so we just want to really celebrate that um in the upcoming show in the next couple of weeks so please tune into that one because yep. we're gonna have a lot of fun on that one and female astronomers too of course like Jocelyn Bell Burnell who's one yep. of the, the leading scientists and, of it and don't forget your your fantastic um Source for for nice trendy cool t-shirts there. <laughs> <Yes. the best laughs> <I've got. laughs> indeed, indeed, yeah. and yeah, you're, you're talking about Justin Bell Bell uh, Burnell, um, obviously from Northern Ireland, but yeah. um, you got Caroline Herschel, who's the first yeah. professional female scientist. If you if you want to take it take it in that uh, context, first professional female astronomer, uh, helping her, her brother, obviously in the late 1700s, famously. Uh, discover of the planet Uranus, but in her own right, Carolyn discovering so many comets. So um, yep. definitely one to to look out for. Anyway, that's us for this week. Yep. Um, we've we've slightly gone over our hour. We normally set out for half an hour at the beginning. Uh, we've gone on for an hour. So massive thank you to our our yep. backroom team, uh, not only for the great t-shirts, but also yep. for uh, sticking with us and being so supportive and amazing. And over to you, Raj. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, great. Thanks again, Nick and Terry, for another great show. Uh, remember, you can catch us on um, Spotify uh, and anywhere else you listen to your podcast now, actually. So if you missed any of today's uh, roundup or our previous ones, um, give us a follow wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, we are slowly growing and growing our space community. Um, and just like Jupiter, um, 
the roundup never fails to disappoint uh, with some great stories uh, on tonight. And once again, remember, you can grab your um, own roundup merch, your Carbonaceous Chondrite t-shirt on the Spacedore website. Uh, just head over to spacedore.co uh, forward slash shop and you can grab yours um, today. Thanks again for a great show. Have a good evening, everyone. And we'll see you again uh, next Thursday for the Space Talk. Thanks again. Thanks, okay. everyone, for listening. Thanks. Seen some great Bye, comments. Everybody. Brilliant. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, uh, my name's Nick Howes, space enthusiast, author, writer, broadcaster. Hi, I'm Terry Mosley, past president of the Irish Astronomical Association, lifelong astronomy and space nerd, absolutely fascinated by everything both man-made and natural up there. So every two weeks, Terry and I give you the latest, hottest news from space and uh, human spaceflight, robotic spaceflight, and what's happening up in the skies. Um, please tune in to us every fortnight uh, with the space stuff. Hi, all.